Hi everybody out there! We are live here at the Fox Island Bridge. You can see the bridge behind me. It is a gorgeous day and we have a really nice low tide today. The tide is about a negative one and a half feet and that's happening in about 10 minutes or so. So it's about as low as it's gonna go today. I'm here with Stina. Everybody say hi Stina. Give her some love. And we are I'm going to be exploring the different intertidal zones here today. Right now, we're standing right at the edge of the shore, and I'll flip this around so you can kind of get the whole picture of where we are on the beach. Hi, Heather. Hi, Tara. Beautiful day. Nice, sunny, partly cloudy. And no one on the beach but us, which is just kind of how we like it around here. All right, so hopefully the wind noise is a little bit better today. We've invested in uh, a little bit of hardware to try to cut down on some of that wind noise. Uh, we're standing here at the edge of the shore and <clears throat> already we can start to see some creatures. Uh, some of the easiest creatures to spot at this beach when the tide is nice and low are these leather stars. And just to show you how many leather stars there are, I'm going to just do a quick walk around and you guys can count with me. Um, here we go. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, okay, there's a lot of sea stars here. One thing, uh, one of the reasons why there are so many sea stars here is because this is really great habitat for them. Being in the lower intertidal zone, this place is only really exposed to air when we have negative tides. So this, uh, this leather star is a good example and you can sort of slightly see him moving very slowly. When these animals are out of the water, they don't have the ability to really move very much at all. They use seawater as their blood. So sea stars don't have their own blood, they use the salt water, which is why you'll never see a sea star living in a lake or a stream or a river. They require salt water to be able to survive. And they use that salt water as their blood. And what they do is they bring that into their bodies through this water vascular system that begins right here with this is called the madreporate and you guys probably didn't see because I did it off camera but um, I got my fingers nice and wet anytime we're at the seashore it's important to wet our fingers um, so that when we're touching the animals our skin isn't abrasive on them and the leather star got its name because it's very very smooth and feels like wet leather most of the other sea stars that you'll find in our area are not smooth at all. Most of them are uh, are really bumpy and rough, um, which is because they're in the group of animals called the spiny kit, spiny skins. Now Howard's asking, what is a group of leather stars called? And I'm gonna go with a biker gang of leather stars, but uh, we'll, have to figure, we'll have to figure that out. Maybe it's a herd, because cows are a herd. I don't know, Howard, you'll have to answer uh, in the comments. <laughs> Maybe a load, Jen's asking. Good good comments. Speaking of comments, if you're watching this from home and you wanna pop uh, your location and maybe the age of the people who are watching, we would love to have that information. Um, we are bringing these digital live videos to you three times a week and um, it's helpful for us to know how far our, our reach is really extending. So if you wanna comment there, we would love to see um, people from all around and then as uh, the video ends, of course, we'll make it available on our page and you can continue to share that as well. And we love shares, we love social media. If you wanna post a photo of yourselves watching this video um, and tag us in it at Harbor Wild Watch on Facebook or uh, Instagram would be great. All right, so Stina looks like she's found something she wants to talk about. So let's get a little bit closer, not too close, six feet, right? Yeah, so. Nice and loud for us, Dina. Yeah, in previous videos, we've talked about the difference between a male and a female crab. Uh, at this beach, we've found lots of bigger crabs, which is a little easier to see the difference. And so we have two northern kelp crabs. One's male, one's female. 
I'll let you take a look and uh, maybe make some predictions about who's who. I can notice one has a bigger set of claws, one is missing some legs, that may or may not have anything to do with it. Their belly flaps are a little bit different. And if you're thinking the belly flaps are the clue, you're right. For our male crabs, they have a skinny, pointy belly flap. Um, and if I compare that to the female crab, her belly flap is nice and wide. And I'm going to set our, our dude down and point out this wide belly flap. Um, for the female crab, this is where she's going to hold her eggs. Now, the eggs are kind of cool because she'll hold thousands of them underneath this pouch, but she can only be fertilized when she sheds her outer hard shell. I kind of give her a tap. You'll notice this is very hard. Her toes are also very pointy. <laughs> they kind of hurt. Uh, but uh, when she molts, her ovidex will be open, and then um, we, might, we might see some crabs today doing the crab hug, where the male is just waiting for that perfect moment to spread their genes. And um, we're also going to look out and see if there's any female crabs with a big uh, bundle of eggs. We'd say they are buried, kind of like a raspberry, because it looks... Uh, like this nice juicy fruit that she's holding, but it's indeed lots of tiny little baby crabs. So um, I think she's waving at you all. <laughs> nice. So, Give us a wave. Crab. Our, uh, our male kelp crab is making his way out to deeper water. It's almost as though he knows by staying in the shallows he is vulnerable to predators. Sea stars, or not sea stars, seagulls, uh, herons, other uh, crows and birds would take advantage of him. Um, so he's making his way into deeper water. Um, and I, Rachel, do you see that? I, I do see this. Ah, cool. ah, this is such a cool find. Uh, this is a California sea cucumber. And this is a bit of a rare creature for the, uh, the intertidal zone. They tend to be a lot lower. Um, and because this is really the first daytime negative tide, um, that's probably why we're seeing it here. Um, so if it were July and we'd had many weeks of lower tides uh, in the area, these animals migrate a little bit deeper out. Um, and what's really fascinating about this creature is the texture of it. Take a look at it. It looks like a big spiny hot dog, um, but it's not the kind of creature that you want to bite into. First of all, those spines are all bluff. This is a very soft and squishy creature. Um, and if I gently can kind of roll him over, I can show you the underside and the tube feet that put this animal in the group with uh, sea stars, urchins, and sand dollars, um, which is really, really kind of cool. Now, this animal um, is different than a lot of our sea stars because instead of having like five arms outward or a hard skeleton, there's no hard parts to their entire body. These are very, very soft and squishy and they um, they get about as long as maybe my arm, so close to three feet long. Really, really cool creature to find. Um, and one of the reasons why I say you don't want to bite into this is because even though it looks spiky, it's not. That, the spikes won't hurt you at all. But the defense of a sea, sea cucumber like this is called evisceration, which means if I were to really threaten him and chomp down really hard. I won't. I'll be gentle. Um, but if I were to try to take a bite out of him, he would, or she, would take their guts and squirt them out their body. And some sea cucumbers have really sticky guts. Others have more kind of stringy and tangly guts. Um, but all that to say, it's not a creature that I really want to mess with. Um, and then the, the sea cucumber would kind of undulate its body and try to gallop to freedom. So really, really cool to see um, this species here. And I noticed another really cool species now that we're out low enough. Um, we've got a clam siphon right here. So most of you are probably familiar with clam shells on the beach and we see lots of those. Um, in fact, there's a clam shell right there from a dead clam, but it's a little more rare and you need a lower tide to see the live clams. Um, and these look to me like pittock clams, rough pittocks. And they are able to take water in one hole and squirt water out the other hole. And that is how they breathe and how they eat. So this is a species that is really dependent on good quality water. If our water quality is degraded, if it's overly polluted, this is a species that's going to suffer. 
um, because it doesn't get a choice in what foods it eats. Whatever comes along drifting on the water um, is what we can see. And you guys at home watching this on Facebook probably can't see, but there is tons of plankton in the water. Hopefully we'll be able to upload a higher quality video of this to our YouTube page after um, this broadcast is over, and hopefully you'll see there are thousands of tiny swirling little bits of uh, animal plankton, zooplankton we call them. There's also probably building up a good amount of phytoplankton now that we're getting longer day length. And then just look at all this beautiful kelp. There is all, oh my goodness, <laughs> Sina, watch your boots. Yeah. Are you going to be brave? Are you going to pick them up? Oh my gosh, this is a professional crab wrangler, people. Crab hug. Oh, look at that. A male and a female. This is a very large kelp crab. We'll say, uh, while the pinchers are pretty scary, what really gets me are the toes. Um, for kelp crabs, you might think about their name, they like to hang out on slippery kelp, and so these pint pointy little toes are a lot like a hypodermic needle, um, and that lets them climb up those slippery kelp strands and um, collect food off of them. Um, this poor lady crab here, she's definitely missing some claws, uh, but uh, hopefully when she molts again she can actually regrow those with um, a new shell. Sometimes what's funny is you'll see uh, a crab maybe with a big pincher like this and then a much tinier pincher, you know that he's trying to regrow that, but this guy looks pretty happy and healthy and uh, it's getting a little crabby so I'm going to yeah, <laughs> safely, set, safely them set them back. Lots of kelp crabs in this area because there's lots of kelp. Now, you may hear us use the words kelp and seaweed and algae inter interchangeably, um, but really there are three distinct kinds. Steve is holding up right now one of my favorite kelps. This is called acid kelp, um, and it's a beautiful brown algae. And acid kelp has got this unique uh, uh, sort of adaptation that it's able to produce hydrochloric acid um, and release it next to uh, other species that may be overgrowing it. So in a lot of places where acid kelp is established, it's usually one of the only kelps around. And it, you can almost always tell acid kelp because it has that mid rib uh, down the center blade. Now algae, kelp, uh, seaweed, none of those are plants. There is only one plant in the Puget Sound in the Salish Sea, and that's eelgrass. Um, and I don't see any here, but I would expect that out there somewhere uh, there would be a little bit more of that eelgrass, um, which is a true plant and looks a lot like the grass in your yard. What we've got here is algae. We've got three different varieties or three different kind of categories for them. And they're usually pretty easy to tell apart because of their color. So we've got red and green and brown. So the acid kelp, um, of course, is a brown algae. It's very slick and slimy feeling. It's also a nice brown algae by your boot, Ooh, the sargassum. Oh yeah, here's a sargassum. This is an introduced species um, that actually thrives here in the Salish Sea. This is from Japan. Um, and it's uh, kind of unique. It's one of the few algaes that we have around here that has lots of these little pneumatocysts. These are filled with gas that help keep the seaweed lifted up. You can see this is really floating here. Um, and the reason it wants to float is so that it can be in the sunlight. Some of these algaes can grow very, very deep, um, maybe sometimes as deep as like 100 feet or so, and they're really stretching to get up into the sunlight. Um, so show, show me what else you've got there, Sina. Yeah, I have a nice little piece of Turkish towel. You can see I was able to pick it up without breaking it off its holdfast because it's attached to a very tiny little rock. Um, and that will help anchor it as it floats around. I do like seeing it in the water though because it gives that nice iridescent shine. Um, kind of sparkles blue a little bit. Um, and I also just love the texture of this seaweed. It's kind of like, imagine a nice scrubby bath towel. Really exfoliate yourself there, so um, a fun yeah, one there. Beautiful. And then I think I saw your Ooh. favorite one, Rachel. Oh, did you see my favorite red eyelet? Yeah. Oh yes, this is my favorite kelp. Very Looks... few people have a favorite kelp. Um, <laughs> I'm one, and this is my favorite kelp. It's a red algae called red eyelet silk, and it gets those holes in it, not from predation, not from anything eating it, um, but naturally as a way to let the currents flow through it. Um, and so that's a good indication that you're in a spot that gets quite a bit of current. And because the shore between Gig Harbor and Fox Island is narrowest here, that's why they built a bridge here, uh, 
we see a good amount of current coming through this, this area. Um, and then of course we've got the green algaes, beautiful green ulva. Um, we've talked about it in previous videos in, in the past weeks, but um, this is a really, really lovely uh, green algae. It's only one or two cells thick. So pretty. Um, and this is totally smooth, and if a piece of it breaks off, the broken piece will continue to survive. So that's a clue that you're not dealing with a plant. Plants have uh, tissues, they have roots and stems and leaves that are all a little bit different microscopically. With algae, they're all the same. Um, just kind of different forms. Here's a really pretty red algae um, that's beautiful when it's kind of flowing in the water like this. I can lift it up. It's got these kind of fan frills on it. Really nice. This one's kind of funny. This is called sea noodles. Another type of red seaweed. Um, the nice thick little branches. <laughs> it's kind of fun if you get a bucket of water and shake this around in it. Sometimes you'll find fun little shrimp living around um, between all the branches. I don't see anybody crawling around at the moment, but cool thing to investigate and imagine eating a, a bowl of spaghetti. Definitely Which, has a very noodly texture yeah. for sure. Uh, so you know, uh, I can't help but notice you've got another yeah. something to talk about so there. This is another good clue that there's some evidence of one of my favorite snail species on this beach, the mighty moon snail. Hey, Stina, I have a joke for you. <gasps> okay. How do you find a giant snail? Uh, I don't know. At the end of a giant's finger. <laughs> <laughs> Add that to the repertoire. <laughs> Stina is a um, fan of uh, cheesy ocean themed jokes. I love jokes. cheesy ocean So jokes. there you go. Uh, if you come on a beach walk with me, usually if we're looking for moon snails, I'm going to make you howl for them. <laughs> uh, luckily right here we found, I don't know, like half a million of them in a nice big collar like this. Uh, believe it or not, there are tiny little snail eggs wedged in between the sand here. Uh, the moon snail is a large snail that has a very slimy foot and it will use that slime and the sand and it will kind of mix it up and lay its eggs right in between, kind of like the filling of an Oreo cookie here. And it will extrude this out, which is why it doesn't connect. And then it will leave it behind, and this will go in and out with the tide, and eventually those multiple thousands of little moon snails will hatch out. Um, and I know some of you might be out there thinking, ah, those mighty moon snails eating my delicious clams! <laughs> but they also feed your clams. Um, as a little baby. So there's a nice circle of life thing going on here. Um, this is also called an egg collar, because check this out. <laughs> the highest of intertidal fashion, darling. Oh, oh. Now we just need some feather boa <laughs> kelp for you. Yeah. Nice. Another thing to point out about this is you can tell the size of the animal that laid it. Um, the inner circle right here is the size of the animal's shell. So you can imagine a shell about the size of my fist. The outer circle here would be the foot. Um, so this is kind of a medium, full-grown uh, moon snail, but uh, it's a little early in the season. So it, as the season goes on, as we get warmer weather, we'll start to see more and more of those uh, moon snail egg cases. So let's, um, let's, we haven't gone very far. I've walked about 10 feet and we've already talked about so many different animals. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I see, I see another animal and it's a live one. Okay, so see the clam. This is what we call a heart cockle. Um, and this is a live heart cockle. And I'm trying to show him. You can see the flesh on the inside there. And they get their name from the perfect heart shape that they make. Oh, don't you love it? This is a full, full size um, heart cockle. And this is a species that's preyed upon um, by a number of things and has a really, really unique escape strategy. Um, when a predator, like one of these many sea stars, like I told you, there's lots of sea stars on this beach. They're everywhere. I have to watch where I step, really. But if, uh, if a large sea star were to come up to this clam, the clam can sense it. It can feel it or smell it or somehow knows that the uh, sea star is trying to attack it. And what it'll do is it'll take its foot, which is basically a big muscle on the inside of here, um, and that foot will extend very quickly out of its shell and will kick the clam down the beach for safety. 
um, and usually they can outrun whatever's chasing them. The one thing that they definitely cannot outrun is a seagull. So when it's low tide, it is lunchtime out here at the beach. Um, hey, I see one of our former sea stars out here. Hey, Wesley! Hi, <laughs> so we've got this, this beautiful heart cockle here. I'm going to place him um, back down right where I found him, under the cover of the water. Luckily, he's probably a little too big for most of the seagulls um, to manage. Um, and so he's fairly safe, but smaller... Uh, small, smaller cockles um, definitely are, are vulnerable to that as well. Um, so I'm walking along. Oh, here's a, here's a horse clam shell. Evidence that we might have some bigger bigger animals out here. Oh, here's an... Okay, I already know I said I had a favorite kelp, but now I found my other favorite. Um, oh, and more of my favorite. This is great. I didn't know there was red eyelets. Look at this beach. Okay, so back to my favorite. Look at that beautiful, holy texture. Very, very pretty. And then I'm not sure if you can see. Ooh, I'm going to try not to fall. <laughs> the footing is not exactly smooth right here. Um, lots of treacherous algae. But hopefully you can see that really, really iridescent, smooth piece of algae here. This is called iridescent kelp. Um, Maziella splend splendens, I think, is the scientific name. Um, and it is just magical. Such a beautiful color. Um, on there. So Brandy's asking why are there holes in this kelp? Um, it is for, you can kind of think of them like speed holes. They are uh, to eliminate the current. So in places where there's lots and lots of current, these can, um, can get really like dislodged in the waves. And so by having holes that allows the water current to go through them rather than rip them, um, that's advantageous for this species. Kind of similar to why um, some leaves have holes in them too. Thinking of um, the Swiss cheese plant, Monsteras. They have holes in them to help them not get torn up by the waves. Oh, there's a lot of this islet silk here. Oh, it's so pretty. So pretty. Okay, enough of the kelp, you're probably saying. <laughs> no, you would never say that. Never. Oh, wait, there's more. More pretty kelp. Yeah, Stina, um, Stina's going to be filming a video uh, shortly in the next couple weeks about uh, seaweed pressing and how you can make art from this beautiful algae. Oh, look at this one. This is a gorgeous. Such pretty colors. It's <laughs> a question we ask a lot of the people. <laughs> Smell it, Stina. I feel like dead. dead. I don't smell. It doesn't stink yet, but I think I might put it down. He's fresh, freshly dead. A nice big red rock crab. Um, these nice pinchers uh, have, has a little bit of. Uh, you're like you're really close. He's gonna come alive and grab you. I know. He died a the moment ago. The crabbiest of the crabs. Um, so, but these ones are the ones that eat the moon snail. And these pinchers are strong enough to break that hard shell. Um, but yeah, this one's not looking too happy. You know how I know it's dead, Sina? Because it's, it's not trying to kill you. Uh, this is the crabbiest crab species of them all. Oh, I don't know. That wiggle. It's got that a wiggle. Bit of a wiggle. Okay, maybe it is alive, gonna, but it doesn't look. Just gonna, you just we'll leave go you be, little there. friend. Good luck. <laughs> More of this acid kelp, beautiful brown blades. Um, I'm gonna. This seems like not a good decision. Um, <laughs> but I'm gonna walk, walk in the water here a little bit because there is a red rock crab that is living. And I'm gonna very stupidly reach in and grab it. Again, certified crab wrangler here. Don't try this at home. This is a, a really nice red rock crab male. Um, and notice the response of this one compared to the one that Stina held. This guy <laughs> goes pinchers out. He's trying to be big and scary and says, don't eat me. Don't mess with me. And you can see I'm moving his mouthpieces. Um, crabs have a mouthpiece called a uh, chelicerae, uh, which is basically these uh, amphipod, or not amphipod, arthropods, the, the shelled creatures. Ooh, I think I see a female. So I'm going to put this guy down, see if I can scoop on this female crab here. And you might be asking, how in the world do I know it's a female without even looking at it? And the answer is practice. The female crabs on the top have a little bit more domed appearance, and the pinchers are a little bit smaller. And notice she's got kind of one wimpy claw and one normal-sized claw. She has uh, gone, 
had a rough life. <laughs> but luckily she's been able to regrow that and has um, a little bit of a pincher. All right, I'm gonna go back the way I came. More of this beautiful, beautiful kelp. Like I said, Sina's gonna be filming a kelp pressing workshop. Um, so we'll have that available for you guys to, to tune in and be able to see we've got more and more and more and more of these beautiful stars. Oh, here's more of this iridescent kelp that you can probably see the rainbow. It's really, really smooth and shiny. Um, it's really stretchy. Stretchy. <laughs> All right, here's more of that Turkish towel. Beautiful. All right, so now we're coming um, to a little bit change of habitat. We still have all this beautiful kelp and the sand down here, but we're gonna explore these rocks here. Um, and the rocks provide a really different habitat for animals that maybe don't move around so much. So we've still got plenty of the mobile creatures down in here, lots of kelp crabs. Lots, lots of kelp crabs. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can count them. Um, but from here, I can see probably 20 or 30 kelp crabs. They are. Oh, look at that red algae. Um, they're, ev <laughs> they're everywhere. Steen and I are geeking out about the seaweeds. Um, okay, but let's let's transition and come up here to these rocks because the rocks have a lot, a lot of life on them. Um, and all of these creatures are really just hanging on until the tide comes back. So right now that is the low tide um, and it'll start to transition and start to return and move upward. Um, and so... These guys are just hanging out here. What we've got here is a beautiful anemone. Um, this anemone here is a gorgeous, gorgeous species. They have this sort of red trunk and then these kind of mottled tentacles. And it is alive, and since my hand is nice and wet, I can gently touch this. Um, and you can see how sticky it is and how it reacts. He just tried to eat me, or, you know, stop me from eating him, um, with a bunch of stinging tentacles. So these anemones, here's another one, beautiful, beautiful, that we call this a Christmas anemone. You can guess why, kind of green and red all over. These anemones are uh, trying to capture and catch any uh, plankton or fish or crustaceans that are, are nearby them. Um, again, still lots of those sea stars to be seen here. Um, and then I'm starting to see some more snails, not giant snails. You would find those where? At the end of a giant's finger. <laughs> Uh, we've got some, oh, check it out. Here's a really cool find. So we saw the California sea cucumber earlier. This is a, what we call an orange sea cucumber. You can tell it's nice and orange. Um, they also have bright orange feeding tentacles that are sometimes maroon, but most often are like a bright, bright orange. Ooh, here's another cool creature. I could sit here all day and just look at these rocks. Uh, here we've got a limpet. Um, can you see this kind of mountain shaped shell? And this is a keyhole limpet, and I can tell because of this little hole right there. And notice when I touch him, he kind of tightens up and moves. Um, here's a keyhole limpet shell. So you can see they really have this mountain shaped type of shell. Um, and they are related to snails and chitons. Speaking of chitons, here we go. Here's a chiton very prehistoric type of snail. They are in the gastropod family. That means stomach foot, which means essentially their mouth is right next to the um, sticky part that they walk along on. And this one is got these eight plates along their side. I saw, oh yeah, here's some more. More anemones. Another chitin here. You can see those eight, eight plates. And those plates are surrounded by kind of a tough uh, rubbery what we call a girdle and the girdle kind of um, holds all of those plates together now there's oh look at these tiny tiny baby I hope you can see this tiny baby little chitons here and a few more here and here lots of little guys and they just hang out on the rocks um, here's another one and they they're pretty sedentary during the day um, but at night they come out and will kind of roam around on the rocks and will start crawling around and they're basically scraping algae off the rock. So these are herbivore snails. Really kind of neat. Now I saw another snail up in here. Oh, here's one. This is called a frilled dogwinkle, and I'm actually going to carefully pull him off the rock so that you can 
get a good look at that foot. So this right here is the foot. And when he's threatened, he's going to go all the way in and show off the operculum, the special trap door that seals him on the inside. So one way that you can tell if there is a snail inside the shell or if there's a hermit crab inside the shell is to look for that trap door. If you can't see it, um, chances are good that there's a hermit crab inside there and probably a pretty small one because they can withdraw all the way within it. So this frilled uh, dogwinkle, you can also tell how old it is by counting the rings on the operculum, um, but it's a little too, a little too dark to see that right there. So I'm going to place this guy back here um, on the rocks. Let's see, what other things can we talk about in here, Sina? Look at these huge anemones. Beautiful. These are uh, a species that loves to catch fish, so they have really, really kind of um, intensely sticky. Let me see how hard he's got a grip on me. Totally trying to eat me. Shooting little tiny uh, harpoons called nematocysts into my body. Um, There's some really great. Oh yeah, there are some calcareous tube worms. Okay, let's see if I can find a good one to show you. Um, see this, I'm going to point to it. This little red blob right here coming out of this white tube. And there are some more of the white tubes here. Those are tube worms. They're related to earthworms and feather duster worms. And when the tide's high, they come out and extend this beautiful red and white striped feeding crown called a corona. Not coronavirus. It's a good corona. Ooh, oh yeah, good, good fight. Okay, so we're gonna go back down to the water level here and show you some anemones that are open and in the water. Sorry for the glare, I can't really do much about that, but you can see these beautiful tentacles wide open and they're just grabbing whatever is near them. Ooh, there are a lot of kelp crabs out there. Beautiful kelp. Okay, I'm gonna make my way. I'm headed for those pilings there. Um, but I have to be really careful. This is uh, really not easy to navigate with one hand on my camera. So uh, I apologize for the unsteady camera job that's happening right here. I'm gonna pause to appreciate this beautiful algae. So pretty, more of that acid kelp. This is just young kelp that's settled here. Um, and by the end of the season, this might be 10 or 12 feet long. Lots and lots of huge kelp crabs. I'm not sure if you guys can see just how many kelp crabs there are here. Uh, There's a jingle shell. Ooh. Some bryzoans on it and some tiny yeah. little and kelp carriers. Tell us about that while I... Yeah, so these bryzoans, they're a moss animal. So believe it or not, it's a living thing. Uh, they encrust on shells and rocks, and so this one here has some nice little lacy bits. Um, it's also, I, I wish we had the other side of the jingle, because you'd see that there's a hole in the shell that attaches to the rock, and then they kind of <laughs> just open up and down. Um, I'm really liking the color. I think oh, this is so, gorgeous. so pretty. Like, if I was a it mermaid, fades. this would be the color of my tail. <laughs> For sure. For sure. And hey, you know, now that I'm crouched down here, I can see another jingle shell right here. But we've got an ochre star. That beautiful purple coloration and the very, very bumpy texture to the skin um, is definitely an ochre sea star. Um, they come in purple or ochre color. Um, it turns out here in the sound, we tend to have more of the purple variety for whatever reason. Um, although we do see an ochre colored one from time to time. And then check this out, a cool, really cool snail that I have found here. This is called a leafy horn mouth. Um, really beautiful shell. These guys are quite common in these rocky areas. Yeah. So around the rest of the South Sound like this, there's not a ton of these big, big boulder type rocks. These were added uh, when the bridge was built and so it's provided habitat for lots and lots of things. There's also uh, the eggs of the leafy horn mouth. Oh. Okay, cool. Exciting. Oh, that is really exciting. Okay, this is really hard to film. All right, we're going down into this crevice. There we go. There's the snails, a couple of them there. And these are their eggs. And they kind of are almost like grains of rice standing on end. And again, more, lots more of these anemones. 
All right, we're under the bridge now, so I apologize if the road noise is a little strong, um, but hopefully you can still hear us. Lots more of those cucumbers down in here. Oh, yeah. All right, so we're right at the lowest part of our tide, about a negative one and a half foot, which is right at the base of the pilings here. And I'm just going to focus on these craters right at the base. Can you see these bright orange little clumps? Those are the feeding tentacles of the orange. And I mean, and here comes a big red rock crab. <laughs> he, he's not very happy. He's like, hey, this is my spot. Get out of here. Crabs are crabby. That's the takeaway. All right, now I'm going to show you one of my favorite groups of animals right here. Look at all of these anemones. These are aggregating anemones. And what's really amazing about them, I'm going to get my hand nice and wet, is you can touch them gently, of course, and they kind of clump up. They move, they respond um, to that touch. Really, really cool animals. Um, and they love to live all together. That's where that name aggregating comes from. They love to be next to one another. We have another type of anemones down here. I'm going to come over to you, Sina. Oh, there's so much stuff I'm passing by. Okay, I'll come back to that. But there's another group of anemones here. These are called plumos anemones. Um, and they <laughs> effectively call them big hanging balls of snot. And you can see them on these other pilings here. They really do look like big hanging balls so of snot. They're not as pretty. They're supported by the water. They look like <laughs> the kind of these amazing the aggregating species, ones. Alright, so let me go back because I, I passed a bunch of awesome things I want to talk about. Okay, so on this piling, instead of being covered with aggregating anemones, we're looking at the world's largest barnacle. These are called giant barnacles and they are huge. Here's my finger for scale. They are, you know, about that big. Um, and I'm hopeful that I can find, there's a special species of crab that loves to live in these holes. Um, when the barnacle shell is open like this, if you could reach inside, that's a dead barnacle. Here's a freshly dead barnacle. You can tell it's freshly dead because there's nothing living in there and it's still bright white. Um, the live barnacles do also move, um, if you touch them. And you, I'm not sure you can hear it. Um, but they are moving in within their shells a little bit, just sort of wiggling a little bit. And these are actually related to crabs and other crustaceans, shrimp, and they have a really different life. So instead of crawling around with lots of legs and pinchers, these are only really mobile for the first part of their lives. They have super glue on their head for about three days. And once they settle, they're stuck there for life. Now, luckily for the barnacles, there's a lot of places to live. And for this species, if they um, survive, they seek out and grow best on other barnacles. So sometimes you'll see one barnacle, like this one barnacle, that's got other barnacles living right on it. Um, and this is a species that's actually edible. Uh, I've heard it tastes like a big prawn. But I, it takes them a long time to get to this size, so I just assume leave them where they are. Um, and this is a species that I was first introduced to by uh, Professor Ernie Karlstrom, a longtime Fox Island resident um, and professor at PLU. And he brought me here to show me these amazing animals, and so I think of him every time that I'm down here. Ooh, gosh, there are just so many crabs. I don't know if you guys can see this. Okay, there is a total pile going on here. On the, I'll see if I can get the glare to ease up. But there's like 40 help crabs all huddled at the bottom of that piling. Now as the tide returns, they are going to go up um, and spread out using their really sharp uh, feet that Stina pointed out earlier. Um, but right now the tide going out has kind of pushed them there. So we are on the Fox Island side of the ridge. We're looking across at Gig Harbor there to answer your question, Sherry. Um, all right, let's go. Oh, oh yeah, look at that. There's a beautiful one. This is an absolutely stunningly gorgeous ochre sea star. Um, and of course, it's purple colored. Oh, 
Oh, see, it's okay. making the excited noise. <laughs> There's a keyhole limpet. And you oh. can see its cute little limpet face. Oh, I love limpet faces. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> the things we get excited about. All right, here's a keyhole limpet. And they have two little antennae. And they have kind of this mouth in the center that's stuck down against the ground. And then they have their foot behind them. Um, but yeah, so, you know, that is super cute. Um, also in here, another chitin with those eight plates. Somebody asked why they have eight plates, and honestly, I have no idea. Um, but here's, ooh, here's another mollusk that um, we see evidence of them. This slimy goo stuff right here is barnacle nudibranch eggs. Um, maybe if I'm lucky, I'll see the actual barnacle eating nudibranchs, but they're very, very cryptic. The word cryptic means they camouflage really, really well. Ooh, here's somebody who's not really camouflaging well, but hope that you can see it. There's a little purple shore crab tucked amongst the crevice here, and I'd be willing to bet there are ooh, lots of them. I'm going to try not to fall climbing on these rocks. Um, I'd be willing to bet there's lots of shore crabs um, in this area, because this is just perfect habitat for them. Lots of small rocks to be able to kind of jump up underneath. Plenty of food. Oh yeah, there's legs of one. He saw me and scattled, skedaddled. Oh, here are some more of those anemones and the sunshine. Just absolutely gorgeous. And I'm going to come back down. Yeah, um, there's some haystack barnacles over here. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about those. I hope you guys are having as much fun as we're having out here because this is like perfection for me. I just got to show you this giant barnacle who's open just a little bit. Again, sorry for the shaky camera work, but this is not easy terrain to navigate. So my apologies there. More. We're back in the sunshine now, so might be able to see a little bit better. Oh, here's a jingle shell, Stina. I found one, yeah. Both, you got one? Oh, you got one. <laughs> hey, dirty hands. But yeah, this uh, is that other side of the jingle shell that we mentioned, <laughs> where the adductor muscle, which is usually the delicious thing you're eating if you ever have scallops, uh, it's the strong muscle that sticks through this hole and will glue itself to a rock and then it can open and close to filter plankton out of the water. And jingle shells grow in one spot, so they really conform to their rock. Here's another um, jingle shell I'm gonna pick up. Um, so the outside of this jingle shell, you can see these little white worms. Those are those calcareous tube worms. And then the inside with that beautiful kind of green color inside there. Oh, I love it. This is kind of cool. So we don't have a lot of sandy beaches, oh, yeah, this um, is and this really isn't sand. <laughs> Does anybody there. know what animal this is made up of? I do. What is it, Rachel? <laughs> well, I have two. I have two guesses. The first is probably barnacles, because yep. there's barnacles so the main so thing. many barnacles, and then I would guess there's probably some muscles. yeah, maybe some mussels, but maybe also some sand dollars too. Yeah. That's um, good but this is very yeah. rich. Barnacle sand. <laughs> barnacle sand. That you can just imagine how many barnacles are. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Dead right the here. The haystack barnacles are on that nice rock behind you. Oh. Yeah. Show me. Oh yeah. Nice. We got another, another species of barnacles. Each of the different variety of species occupy just a slightly different habitat. So, um, a lot of times they're together. They they kind of um, are. Com in competition with one another, but these haystack barnacles or thatched barnacles um, have a really reinforced shell on the outside. Um, and they seem to be really prone to these very, uh, very current driven areas. Um, let's see what else is in here. Lots more of those cucumbers. Some of these sea stairs are just hanging in there. Don't worry, buddy, the tide is returning. All right. Ooh, another beautiful ochre sea star. This is a great find. These are uh, animals that have been really declining lately due to sea star wasting syndrome, um, which is a kind of a disease of sea stars that's taken over over the past maybe six or seven years, and we've seen a decline in the health of our sea stars. Um, the leather stars, though, don't seem to be very affected by it. We've got lots and lots and lots of leather stars. I'm not worried about leather stars at all, on Fox Island anyway. Um, more beautiful red algae here. I really like this. Great. And the Mentis one. Oh yeah, that is really pretty. 
Yeah, really gorgeous. We've got, we've got, we've seen a lot of stuff today, so maybe mention in the comments what your favorite thing has been. Goodness, look at the size of this barnacle. Um, that's my hand, and that's one giant barnacle. Really, really cool species to see. I noticed how the aggregating anemones are kind of in the higher spot, and then as it gets lower, oh, yeah. there's the plumos anemones. Good observation. A little zonation happening here under the bridge. Can you see those bright orange tentacles? They're hard to focus on, but really, really gorgeous. And again, more of this really pretty, different species of kelp. More chitons. Oh, this rock's got tons of chitons on it. This one, trying his best not to look like a chiton. <laughs> Another one. Another one. This is a different species here that we've seen. There is just so much life here. Lots of, lots of current that rips through this area, keeping all the water fresh and just so many species. And again, more anemones. Wow. Like, anybody want to count these anemones? No? <laughs> oh, Heather, I'm so excited that you're excited about kelp now. Oh, here's another species of anemone. Now, this is not an aggregating anemone. It's called a moon glow anemone. Um, they're very closely related species. Here's another one right next to the sea star few more down in here. Really, there is life everywhere that you look. And sometimes, oh, there's death too. Sorry, uh, red rock crab. But judging by the size of you, you're full grown and done your thing. All right, so I think we're going to head back. Um, if you've got a favorite creature and you want to share it with us, we'd love to hear it. Otherwise, thanks for tuning in. Be sure to share this video. Um, if you want to support Harbor Wild Watch during this time, we welcome your donations, and those can be made on our website, harborwildwatch.org. Um, yeah, there we go. Signing off. Sina, say goodbye. Bye, everybody.